and welcome to the Over 50 Health and Wellness Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin English, founder of The Silver Edge. Our mission at The Silver Edge is to inspire men and women in their 50s, 60s, and 70s and beyond to live their strongest, healthiest, most fulfilling lives. In this podcast, we share stories of amazing individuals who are doing just that to help motivate you to become the healthiest version of yourself, regardless of your age. And now, on to today's podcast. Hello, my guest today is Darvis Sims. Darvis is a 61-year-old ACE certified personal trainer, a fitness author, and a master's national powerlifting champion with over 25 years experience in the health and fitness industry. Darvis, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much. Honored to be here. And I'm glad to have you. Thanks. I appreciate your time. So certainly want to talk to you about your fitness journey, want to talk to you about your powerlifting championship, but let's, let's back up first and... Talk a little bit about your background, starting with your childhood. What were you like as a kid? Were you, uh, were you an active kid? Were you involved in sports? Yeah, sure. Uh, when I was a kid, well, I, Kevin, I grew, up on a, I grew up on a farm, a little small farm. And, uh, you know, I was uh, active in every sport I could, I, could, I could be in as a participate in. You know, we, uh, uh, when, I was, when I was a small kid, I uh, got in, into, really got into weightlifting and, and fitness, as the, as the term is known now, through through some, actually the, the old Charles Atlas ad that, that was, you know, don't let people kick sand in your face. <laughs> so I got a Charles Atlas, I got a Charles Atlas program and that's where my fitness journey began. So uh, from that as- aspect, I didn't, you know, growing up in a, in a small town in, in, um, in rural North Carolina, I didn't have access to a, to a gym or any fitness equipment. So I made up my own fitness equipment uh, out, of, out of things that we had on the farm, such as bricks and cinder blocks and tires and that kind of thing. So I guess you could say I, I invented the uh, boot camp, <laughs> a boot mm-hmm. camp before it was a boot camp. So, you know, when I got in high school, I started playing, playing sports. I played baseball, basketball, base, I mean, and, and football. So all, all the major sports, uh, that was everything we had in high school. But uh, from that point, yeah, that's basically my childhood. And let's see, I think I remember you telling me you actually excelled in baseball. Is that right? Yeah, baseball was my big sport. I mean, I had a, a lot of colleges interest, interested in me in my, my junior year in, in, uh, in baseball. Um, I was probably the top pitcher in my, in my whole county. Uh, there's something called American Legion Baseball, where it's basically you play over the summertime, they, they get a bunch of the, the best high school players together for your county and compete against one another. And uh, by the end of my junior year, I had a lot of colleges interested in me. Uh, but unfortunately, during that time, there wasn't any, uh, any regulations about how many games you could pitch or how many innings you could pitch in high school. So my senior year in high school, you know, we had a 20-game schedule. I started 15 games and finished 15 games. And by the time, uh, by the, time the season was over, I could hardly pick a baseball up and throw it. So uh, my, that sort of washed, washed away my baseball hopes. Yeah. So um, you, I know that you talked about potentially some schools looking at you for pitching, but then it sounds like you kind of threw your arm out. What did you, what did you end up doing and going to school for? So now I wound up, you know, I got, got kind of discouraged with the whole uh, traditional education uh, from that point. So I, I uh, enrolled in a community college. Wilson County Community College at the time and, and, and uh, got an associate's degree in mechanical drafting and design. And uh, I was very fortunate. I got, got named to be who's who among American junior colleges. And uh, a company called Carolina Power and Light Company came on campus and they, re- they recruited me right out of uh, tech school to go to work for them. And fortunately, they had, a, uh, um, they had a program where you could do a correspondence course with the Carolina Power and Light Company. And and, and pick up your bachelor's degree in, in engineering. And that's what I did. And, and I went on to become an engineer and uh, spent, what, 16 years in the corporate life. And, uh, you know, they started to have layoffs and, at, 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 the, at the company. And, but they, you know, they, it wasn't voluntarily, voluntarily, voluntary layoffs. They had, uh, but I volunteered, I volunteered. I said, well, you know what? Let somebody keep the job that 
that wants this job because uh you know I knew fitness fitness had always been my uh always been my passion so I got vested in the company's pension program and and uh, left the corporate world and started my own fitness business. So somewhere along that that journey, you got your ACE certification. Is that right? Was that before or after you had, had dropped out of the the corporate world? No, actually, you know, while I was still in the corporate world, I was I was making my plans a leap. You know, I was making my plans plans to make that leap, and uh, I uh, actually ran into a guy who was, was a uh, a personal trainer in the '80s. Back uh, while I was working out at the time, I met been a YMCA. I, I can't forget or maybe I think it was a, a, one of the first gold goals franchises in, in town. So I ran into a guy, I saw a guy who was training some people and I was like, I wonder what this guy is doing. I'd never seen a personal trainer at that time. So I asked him what he was doing. He said, well, you know, I'm a personal trainer. I train people. I show people how to work out, which you know, at that time I thought was kind of silly because I was like, man, doesn't everybody know how to work out? The gym should know how to work out. But, you know, I've been reading muscle and fitness magazines and stuff. I must have, uh, I'll up, I'd read hundreds by the time I joined the gym. And so uh, I said, that sounds kind of interesting. So I started uh, inquiring and looking into the, the personal training, training aspect. And I looked at some certification agencies. And I found uh, the American Council on Exercise, known as ACE, A-C-E, uh, studied for their course, um, independently uh, set in for the exam and fortunately passed the exam and that was back in 1993 so and then I started picking up some uh, some part-time clients and training some part-time pe- people part-time and by the end of 1996 you know three years later I was just ready to make that leap and uh, finally made the courage up to uh, to make the leap and I did and I uh, haven't looked back since Fantastic. So you're truly following your dreams at that point. Now, I think you said that when you got out of um, got out of the corporate world, before you got into powerlifting, did you? I think you found bodybuilding first. Is that right? Yes, I did. You know, I, I uh, I've always been competitive, and whatever you know, whatever um, um, competition kind of strikes my interest. Competition kind of keeps me going harder at things. And so it was. I was fortunate enough at the gym where I worked out at that uh, there were a bunch of uh, nationally ranked power, I mean not power lifters, but bodybuilders there. So I kind of fell under their wings, followed what they, followed, followed what they were doing, and uh, became a you know competitive bodybuilder. And I competed in some, some, some local and some state statewide shows, and yeah, I did pretty good in local shows and placed in statewide shows, but you know, when I went to make that next step, I saw that the people who were winning the shows were doing something a little bit different than what I was doing. You know, they were they were on the they were on the performance enhancing drugs and steroids at that time, the human growth hormone. And I knew I never wanted to go, go that route. I've always been natural, and I think that uh, over the long run, it's, it's proven going to be uh, a real benefit that I never uh, did never did any drugs or that type type of thing. So uh, yeah, and then. You know, basically, I went to work. Uh, I mean, I was working, but I, I stopped competing for a while in anything and just, you know, building my business. You know, and I built me built me a, a very successful personal training business. And then, uh, about three years ago, I, uh, I was like, man, I'm, you know, my workouts. I need, need to do something to 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 put some more juice, put some more life in my workouts. So. I started looking into powerlifting, and I said, oh, you know, I'm pretty. I was 58 at the time. I was like, man, man I'm pretty strong. I think I'll, uh, I think I'll start looking into some powerlifting. And from that point on, I really didn't know what I was doing. I mean, I, I uh, followed a couple around people around in the gym, see what they were doing who were powerlifters. And fortunately, uh, uh, <laughs> Kevin, the first, <laughs> the first competition that I competed in was the North Carolina State competition. And uh, powerlifting is, is broken down into, uh, they have, have a teenage group, they have, and this is both male and female, they have a teenage, teenage category, uh, they have an open category, uh, they have a m- several masters category, where actually masters one, which starts in the 40s, masters two, which starts in the, the 50s, and masters three, which starts in the 60s. 
Now, all of these categories, they have different weight classes in them also. also. So, so you're comp so competing on, on, um, on, a, on the same apples to apples, same basis. And within these categories, which I didn't know at the time, is they have what they call a, an equipped category, which means you, you lift with the, com the compression shirts and the compression uh, knee, knee, knee wraps. Uh, that's legal in that. And then they have a raw division. Well, the raw division, the only thing you can do is use knee sleeves, which are different than, than compression knee wraps and uh, wrist wraps. So I had no idea. I've been, you know, I've been, I've been, uh, I've been working out and been preparing for the competition with, with, with competition knee wraps, compression knee wraps. So when I walk in to, to, to registration, and ask you what your name is, and you know, they find your name. So, oh, I see you competing equipped. Well, you're the only one competing equipped in the whole show. And it was like, I don't know, a couple hundred people competing. I thought, well, I don't want to be the only one competing equipped. So I, I said, I'll compete raw. I, didn't, <laughs> I had no idea what raw was, but I, but I knew I was competing raw. But uh, long, story, long story short, you know, uh, there was, I think there were, 15 guys in my class, and most of them had competed before, and this was uh, my first time. And you know, you got to follow, you got to follow the judges. Uh, you're judged by certain criteria, like how deep you squat. You just, your hips have to drop below your knees, and there are different commands. And you know, I walk into this thing fresh and just just seeing what the commands were and that kind of thing. But long story short, I you know I finished in the top. I think top eight of my class but that was in the 50s and then uh, I was kind of discouraged but encouraged but it was you know it's my first competition and so I'm I'm I'm, I'm learning a little bit more about powerlifting and uh, my second competition was a competition called battle on the border which I, it was in March of the next year and I competed uh, in that competition, and I didn't know how big the competition was, really. But this is what really got me into power lifting, knew and then knowing that I could do it. So, battle on the border is a the best power lifters coming from several states. I think it was it was North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee, and maybe there was another state. What was it? But anyway, it was it was several states. So I get there, and, and all these guys. I look up and all these guys, I'm like, what have I stepped into? And uh, but I competed. And, and Kevin, I didn't even know how to keep score, you know, what the score was what, for. And uh, I'm standing at, you know, it's a, it's a very long day powerlifting. You know, you've got at that competition, I I think they had three, three, four hundred competitors, you know, across all classes. And that is, you know, you start at nine in the morning and you finish at five thirty six in the evening. So I'm standing there. People are calling out the uh, the winners of different classes and that kind of stuff. Kind of stuff. They're giving away the awards. So I'm standing there, and they go, "Well, in the masters, two, masters two division, which I was still competing in, 50 to, you know, the 50 division, uh, second place trophy. Second place, it's not a trophy. They go, it's medal. It's, like, it's a medal like uh, like the Olympic medals. They they award medals in gold, silver, and bronze." So the civil medal, medal goes to Darvis Sims. And I was caught all by surprise. I said, why? Are you kidding me? <laughs> I've got second place in these, amongst these lifters. But that was a big feather in my cap. And it made me knew, it made, I knew at that point that I could compete. And then um, I knew I could compete at that level uh, of competition. So that qualified me to do the nationals that year. I did the nationals in the M2, which is the 50s class. And uh, that was in Orlando, Florida. And I think that what year was that? It had to be a couple of years ago because it was 59 years uh, Yeah, 59 years old. And uh, I, you know, there again, this, this time, this was the best lifters all over the country coming together. And, yeah, I placed 12 out of 13, which, you know, it wasn't wasn't bad. I mean, I was kind of disappointed, but I knew the next year, and I started, this one I really started getting into 
uh, getting into what the rules were, statistics were, I, you know, of how to do the lifts and that kind of thing. So I was very fortunate in the fact that I made the nationals really not knowing what I was doing. So that next year, uh, I was looking at all the numbers, like the numbers from North Carolina, the records, and in and, 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 and my class, I moved up a class, which was M3, uh, Masters over 60. And uh, I saw all the records for North Carolina that year. And I said, and this was in 2018. I said, you know what, I can, I think I can break every one of those records. You know, they're, they're, and powerlifting, there's three, three lifts. There's a squat, there's a bench press, and there's a deadlift. So I, I looked at the records for, in my class, for, um, the past, and I saw him. I said, Man, I'm pretty close to that right now in my training. So I went into the 2018 meet in North Carolina, and uh, I thought, well, you know, I can, I know I can, I can, and can set all those records, which that was my goal in, of, uh, in that year. So I went to the competition, and I had probably, well, actually, not probably, the best lifting day I ever had up to that point. So I set Every record for North Carolina and the squat and the bench press and then the uh, deadlift for my for my uh, for my division and uh, I still hold those records today, which is something I can you know look back on and go, hey, who's the who's the strongest guy in the 60s in the division is Darvis Sims, and so uh, I went on to the to the uh, nationals that qualified me for the nationals in 2018. And really, they're called the, the raw nationals, and it's because everybody lifting there is raw. You know, you can only use, you can use, of course, you can use the weight belt, you use the weight belt, uh, wrist wraps, and knee sleeves. So, I, you know, they keep up, they they keep a pretty current database on on, on lifting and records on each state and the organization that I lift in, which is which was called the USAPL, United States of America. Powerlifting Association, and I saw that going into the nationals, I was necking that neck and neck with a guy out of Pennsylvania. You know, we had honestly we lifted the same amount of weight in the in the state competition in the, each of our state competitions. So for he had squatted more, and I had I had him on the bench. He had squatted more, and I had him on the bench press and the uh, and the deadlift. So. I go to the Nationals in Spokane, Washington in, in 2018, and I meet this guy, uh, and we've become very good friends then, and since then. And uh, we, you know, by the time the first lifts are all over, we are, we are pretty good ahead of everybody. But he's pretty good ahead of me because I didn't really have, I didn't really have my best squat day. And, and I look up, and this guy, he has his best squat day. As a matter of fact, he has a squat day where he sets a new world record on the squat. So I'm uh, 80 pounds behind this guy. And basically what, what they do is they total up your best lifts, your best lifts, and who has the biggest total at the end of the day, they, they're the champion. So I knew I could uh, creep into his lead on the bench press. Well, I didn't have a bench press day like I, I'd had before in my previous meets. I mean, I was uh, bench press. Let's see, in my previous meet, I my top bench press was like 320 pounds, and this meet 308. So I'm like, wow, you know, I missed my last two lifts, but I got 308. So that that gave me that gave me life to continue on. So I'm still behind this guy by 70 some odd pounds, and we go to uh, we go to the last lifts, which is a deadlift, and. Uh, I yell yeah, because since he's ahead of me, I had to go. I go first, so I I go somewhere along the mid 400. Well, like 470 pounds on my first attempt. I get that, and he, and he comes in and he misses his first attempt on uh, on the deadlift. So you have three attempts at each lift, and they take the highest one. So I go back and I go. Well, I really got a chance to get the carbon to this guy's lead now. He's probably going to be conservative on his second lift. So I go back with my second deadlift. 496, 496 pounds. He goes back and hits his first deadlift, I think somewhere around 430 pounds. So that difference is about six. That that difference of 70 pounds is carved to 10 pounds then. then. 
and was fortunate enough that at, at that point, because my deadlift was better than his, he had to go first. So he went ahead of me, and I think he deadlifted maybe 440 pounds. So I said, I looked at the chart. I was like, oh, uh, it looks like I've got to do about 400 and well, way over a little bit over 500 pounds of beating. So I wanted to make sure I did. So I said, okay, put 512 pounds on the bar. I never lifted that before in my life, but I was like, I'm either going to beat him or I'm going home in second place. <laughs> so I put 512 pounds on the bar. And Kevin, I, you know, I was so, I mean, I was so focused on lifting that. It felt like when, when I came up with it, it felt so easy. I think I could have done. 100 pounds more, but I did enough to win, and uh, that was the that's it. That was that's where I am in my powerlifting career right now. Yeah, that's that's quite an accomplishment, obviously, to be the national champion there, and that's a great story the way you tell it. It came down to to the two of you, and he had you in in a couple of lifts, and you had to make it all up there on that on a fantastic deadlift PR. Um, I, I think I read one of your posts where when you were talking about that, you said that's a, a weight. Obviously, it's a weight you've never hit, but that you're stronger now than you were, say, in your 20s when it comes to those kinds of lifts. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, in, in my 20s, uh, let's see, in my 20s, I think I, I know I couldn't bench press 300 pounds because that was that was a goal. Uh, neither could I squat over 400 pounds, which, you know, my biggest squat in a competition. Now is uh, what 470 pounds. No deadlift. Now deadlifts. I've always been pretty strong at deadlift. So uh, I was probably in the upper 400s in my 20s doing deadlifts, but I never never topped that 500 mark. You talk about um, the key to being healthy and fit as as you age is constantly making healthy lifestyle choices on a daily basis, and obviously you've done that to be at your age, at your fitness level and competing at that level. You know, you, you read every, every now and then on the internet, you know, people over 40 shouldn't squat and you shouldn't do deadlifts. It's dangerous. And, um, you know, certainly people shouldn't do squats or deadlifts with, with horrible form, but I'm a big proponent of, um, keeping up your strength as you age, as I'm sure you are. So tell us, um, you know, things are a little crazy right now. Um, if, if you're listening to this in the future, we're recording this in April of 2020 and we're in the, in the middle of all of this Corona craziness, but tell me what's, what's next from a power lifting perspective. I, I'm assuming that any near term events are, are, are probably canceled or, um, what's next for you there? Well, you know, next is, um, yeah, then, well, you know, they've had to reschedule the whole power lifting, uh, event schedule this year because of the, the coronavirus. And uh, so they've come out with uh, the state, the state uh, competition is sometime in, in uh, June, which I hope happens. And then the uh, national competition is this year is in Columbus, Ohio in, uh, in September. Uh, so basically in powerlifting, what you have to do is, is you, uh, you qualify for the nationals basically by doing your state competition. So uh, that's the way I do it. And there's some other competitions you can qualify for, but I'll, quali- I'll try to qualify for, this, for the nationals during my state competition and go back and win the national title again and, uh, uh, and get named to, they hopefully do enough to get named to the world team and where we you know, compete on a, on, a, uh, on a world stage. And that's my, that's my goal, really. My goal is, my goal is to, to, to win a world championship. And I think once I win a world championship, I'll probably hang up the power lift and the power hmm. lift and, uh, Yeah. I don't, I don't know what's left, what's left for you there after that. Once, once you win world, um, well, this is a good segue into, um, some of your, some of your other work. I, I've, I've taken a look on your website and you've got a lot of publications and, and you have publications outside of just physical training as well. We might dig into some of that, but you're a big, big proponent on positive mental attitude. In fact, yesterday you had a, um, an Instagram post where you felt like it was the most important part of a, um, being a healthy 60 year old. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of, um, of a positive mental attitude? Yeah, I mean, sure, Kevin. I mean, I think, yeah, that, that is the number one. That is the number, that is, 
is the biggest key to aging healthy and strong, in my opinion, from what I've seen over the last 25 years when working with clients. You know, I mean, I've gotten to the point now where my clientele, most of my clients are 50, 50 plus, you know, they're age 50 plus. And the people who have a positive outlook on life, have a positive uh, mindset, they're, they're the ones that get the, the best results. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm always encouraging, like, yeah, you can, you can lift this. You know, I've, I've got people to come in and go, yeah, they've been, let me back, back up a step. The, the, the unfortunate thing is that, is like you said a, a few minutes ago, is that you read things online and, and, and you hear things from, from the, the medical perspective. And, and no, and no, no uh, you know, I respect the, me, the medical field. I mean, oh, has my utmost respect. But you read things and people come in and doctors will say to clients, well, you shouldn't be lifting this amount. You shouldn't be lifting that amount over a certain age. But strength training, you know, the studies, studies show it now, but strength training is, is the number one key factor to keeping your strength and your muscle as you age. Now, keeping your strength and your muscle as you age is, is of utmost importance to your well-being as you age. And I'm to the point. I'm to the point in my life is that I want to be strong, yes, but I also want to have a good quality of life. And I, I don't think without having a a positive outlook, kind of looking at hey, my better days are ahead of me, and 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 b having the health. Uh, I saw. I heard it a long time ago. Health span, which means years being healthy. What is it? And, you know. Why, why live to be 90 years old if you can't move? Yeah, I, and I agree wholeheartedly. And I, and, um, I think that's a, a theme that kind of resonates on this podcast with other guests as well as, you know, they, they exercise for a number of different reasons, but, um, and, and are fit at this age for a number of different reasons, but almost all of them have that one common, you know, I, I want, I want to be healthy. I want to be functional. I, I want to be fit and confident and at this point in my life and for the next decade and decades. So that's a, a key for, for folks as, as they age. So let's say somebody's listening to this and they're, you know, they're in their fifties or sixties. Maybe they were, maybe they were active when they were younger or earlier in life. And for whatever reason or not so much now, maybe they're a little, a little overweight. Uh, they hear this podcast, they find your, they find your, um, Instagram and maybe they're a little intimidated or don't know where to start. What would you tell somebody in their later parts of life? Who's inspired by the story and wants to get started on a, on a fitness journey, their own fitness journey. I would say if, if, if you, you sort of, if you've been active in the past, uh, and you really want to start on this fitness journey, I would say start with start with finding you a, a good personal trainer of somebody who's I would say who's 50 plus because they kind they kind of they they know the experience of of aging they've seen it and then they've experienced them themselves. Find somebody who's who's 50 plus who's who's a very good trainer who's certified nationally certified by. Uh, uh, a, a good certification agency, and let them design let them design a fitness program for you. And it's going to be it's going to be safe. It's going to be effective. I guess the number one thing that I see with people who who used to be the athlete in high school or the athlete in college who now are in their fifties and they've been inactive for several years and they, and they go back in the gym and they think they can do what they did when they were in college. Well, yeah, I think you can you can work up to that point, but it takes it takes it takes some careful planning to get your strength level back to that point. You know, I think you can get back to that point. Uh, you may, you may not. But you know, if you go into this thing of, hey, I used to, I used to bench three hundred pounds. I'm, you know, in the first week in the gym, you put three hundred pounds on the bar. Guess what? You're gonna be out with an injury for a long, long time. So you want to do this thing. You want to do it smart, and you want to do it injury free. But you can progress. You can you can you can gain muscle, you can gain strength, you can gain uh, endurance if done the correct way. Absolutely. So that's that's great advice. Obviously, finding a, a, a qualified uh, coach or trainer. What about the role of nutrition and recovery? I, I imagine that's important for 
all ages, but specifically for folks um, getting up in their 50s, 60s, and 70s? Do you have some thoughts on um, nutrition and recovery strategies and its role in, in building strength? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, nu- nutrition, you know, no matter what age, nutrition is a, is the biggest factor. Uh, you know, what you put in your body, you know, if you think of it from a perspective of fuel, if you put high quality fuel in your body, you're going to get high quality results, and especially as you age. I, my, my rule, my, I won't say it's a rule, but generally what I, what I do in my diet is, is I, uh, I monitor basically the protein, the amount of protein that I eat. And that becomes, that becomes more important the older you get because the older you get, the less efficient that your body is in, in digesting protein. And, and using protein. Now, protein is very, very important because protein is the building blocks of, 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 of your muscles and tissues and hair and nails and all that kind of, kind of thing. So basically, you know, all proteins are broken, broken down into amino acids, and amino acids are very, very vital, really a really vital part of, part of every process that takes place in your body. Now, so you have to eat enough protein as you age to build and repair muscle. Now this this muscle this muscle you know you start you start to lose muscle as early as your thirties, right? If you're inactive, you can start losing muscle mass as early as your thirties, and that that process accelerates with time if you don't do anything to to counter that. Well, the two the two major the two keys to counter and even reverse muscle loss is strength training, working out with weights, and eating enough protein. So those are the two keys. Now, let's say you're strength training, but you're not eating enough protein. So I was fortunate enough to work to have done some work with a, a man by the name of Doc, Dr. Donald K. Lehman. Dr. Lehman was, was the foremost, one of the foremost scientists on protein synthesis. So he found out that if you don't eat 21 grams of protein in any one setting, the process of protein synthesis which is the building and repair of muscle doesn't happen. And that, that process is very energy intensive. So when you're doing, just like we're doing, we're sitting here talking or you're sitting around reading or you're at your desk at work or whatnot, your body, your body loves to, burn, to bring body fat into its furnace and burn body fat during those, in those activities. So it's two fronts. Two prong approach here. So if you if you're getting enough protein, you're building muscle, and also as a, a benefit of building that muscle, you're burning body fat. So who doesn't want to build muscle and burn body fat at the same time? So you can make that happen if you're getting enough protein in your diet to start this process called protein synthesis, the building and repair of muscle. And it takes at least 21 grams of protein at a meal to start that process. Yeah, that's well said, and I think that that's um, is a misconception a lot of, uh, around a lot of older people. I, I see, you know, some of that older food pyramid type stuff from the '60s and '70s, where you had your your grains and then your your fruits and vegetables, and then your meat, and then your your uh, you know your your saturated fats at the very very top. And um, I, I see people eating that way and and losing muscle mass, and I, I think that that message is lost on a lot of folks that that protein synthesis story specifically. So that's that's very well said. Thank you. Yeah, that's that, that's that's right. People eat a lot of eat a lot of carbs. Well, Darvis, you're obviously very strong. You're a great ambassador for aging folks in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. You're an inspiration. Um, I found you on Instagram. Where where can people learn more about you? I, I know you've got your website. Um, where would you like to direct folks that are listening to this that would like to either learn more about you or get in contact with you? Yeah, to my website. It's www.strongandfitover50.com. And there you can find uh, a ton of information about working out, uh, about strength training programs, nutrition. I've tried to, I've tried to put everything in one spot that you need to know about if you want to age healthy, fit, and strong. Yeah, so that's www.strongandfitover50, and that's the number 50.com. 
and I'll drop that okay. as well as your Instagram handle into the show notes as well. So people can go there and, and, and look you up and uh, perhaps reach out to you. So Darvis, I just want to thank you again for being on the show and obviously best of luck in all your future endeavors. I really appreciate that, Kevin. Thanks for having me and uh, hope you have a wonderful day. Well, that's our show for today, folks. If you enjoyed today's episode, please tell your friends and please consider subscribing and giving us a five-star review. All the show notes and much more are available at our website at silver-edge.com. That's silver-edge.com. So until next time, stay strong.